said, it is my uh, just enormous pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of Rockwell Inter uh, Automation and a Woodruff School alum, Blake Moret. Well, hold that thought about uh, our relationship uh, back in the day there. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, thanks so much for uh, uh, being here today. I'm looking forward to uh, spending a little bit of time uh, talking about um, the factory of the future, um, uh, some of the things uh, over uh, a uh, long but not yet done uh, career in, in this business that uh, um, have uh, come true, some things that haven't come true, and uh, uh, have some time for questions at the end to uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about. But first, um, just a, a single slide on the company that I've worked for my whole career. Um, I had been a uh, summer intern uh, with Rockwell's Missile Systems Division back in the days that there was a Rockwell International. And to my surprise, I found that uh, shortly before going to Milwaukee to work for the independent, isn't it great, we don't have to answer to share owners, Alan Bradley Company, we've been purchased by the Rockwell, isn't it great that now we have money for lots of investments, public company international. And so uh, that, was, uh, that was in 1985. Today we're a, a $6 billion plus company. Um, we're the world's largest company that's devoted exclusively to industrial automation and information. We compete against a lot of larger companies, but they do other things. Uh, we're in 80 countries, and all we do is industrial productivity. So it's saving uh, manufacturers money is, uh, in a nutshell, what we do. The market uh, that uh, makes up industrial automation and information is about $160 billion. And uh, when you think of the Internet of Things, when you think of the... Um, the uh, basic pieces that make up what people talk about as the industrial internet of things. It starts with the products at the, at the ground floor, the sensors, the variable speed drives, uh, the motor contactors, some not, not super exciting uh, pieces of equipment, but that are really important to the overall equation because that's where the data is born. And then it goes up, it's aggregated in, in controllers, um, there's uh, software either at the edge or in the cloud that, uh, that performs operations to analyze that data and to turn it into useful information. And all the different pieces, the building blocks that bring that together is about $160 billion. It's moved fairly slowly um, as an industry, not nearly as fast as the IT world, and a lot of that is risk, and we'll talk about that in a minute. People are worried about the bad thing happening on the factory floor, not being able to make good products, and those companies are in business to make good products. And so change happens very slowly, much slower than in the, the carpeted part of the enterprise. So getting back to uh, a little bit of context on this. Um, I graduated in 1985. In 1987, I uh, uh, presented a paper to the uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers on the factory of the future, um, and uh, Dr. Wepfer uh, sponsored me for, uh, for that paper. I have that paper uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a flagrant disregard for our records retention policies. Um, I, I still have it. It was hand typed. Uh, in fact, uh, this morning, I, uh, I noticed a, um, um, a typo that I hadn't seen before uh, <laughs> in a long time. The, the paper was okay. Um, it, it wasn't anything uh, uh, super special. Um, it, was a, it was a decent attempt. And this is one of those rare opportunities to take essentially a, a 30 year open book redo to be able to uh, go back and uh, to uh, to improve on uh, some of the concepts and also to take a look at what happened over that period of time, what didn't happen, and, uh, and so on. So a uh, little bit of context there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we find ourselves today um, dealing with, kind of the backdrop uh, for, for this industry, is um, 
Um, first of all, the rise of the middle class in emerging economies around the world. As more people get to a point for the first time in history to be able to uh, have wider choice in the food that they eat and, and to have clean drinking water and to have pharmaceuticals that help them live longer and healthier lives, that's driving a lot of the automation today. Um, as uh, big companies, multinationals, many of them US-based, are trying to uh, uh, engage in markets uh, all around the world, that's a big part of the fundamental driver of this industry. What we have in opposition to that is an aging workforce. There are fewer and fewer people who have an interest or an aptitude to be able to interact with the advanced equipment that's a part of modern manufacturing today. You also see in industry itself, we see global supply chains that uh, are, are mature, uh, pretty much uh, inextricable, It'd be very hard to unwind the, uh, the complex supply chains all around the world. And also uh, deconglomeratization, which is to say, you know, there's, there's pressure on big companies that do a lot of diverse things to be able to uh, focus on, you know, what are their core competencies. There's less interest today in, uh, obviously, you see, you know, the GEs of the world under pressure to kind of, you know, get back to the, the fundamental things that they can add value in. So as a pure play, that's nice. Uh, you know, we, we'll see things go in and out of style, and somebody will be talking about vertical integration in a few years, but uh, uh, today that's one of the key trends. And then in industry, the single biggest trend in the factory automation and information world is that convergence of information technology and operational technology or know-how. And we're seeing that play out in plants across a variety of industries today. It's real. The technology that you, know, you grew up with um, that is now making its way down to the factory floor uh, and then it needs to be coupled with the application expertise. Uh, the technology alone is not enough. It takes an understanding of what you're actually trying to get done. And so we see that as um, the state of, uh, of the industry today. It still requires people. It still requires people to complement the technology and to focus it in the right direction. We see you know, mass customization, particularly with uh, um, you know, things like additive manufacturing. We see the ability to uh, have high higher and higher volumes, but still be able to customize uh, those products. And we're seeing that across a variety of industries. That's nothing new to the automobile industry, but even in consumer products. When you get a, a bottle of soda pop and it has your name or it has whatever holiday you know, that you're uh, buying uh, uh, you know, for a picnic for, then uh, you know, that's the customization and that packaging is a big part of what's driving automation today, is, uh, is to be able to, be able to hit the kinds of volumes um, that these companies need, but still be able to customize it to make it personal for, for the consumer. Even though the number of people in manufacturing today has reduced as a percentage of the population, manufacturing still has an outsized impact on the economy in a few areas. Research. The vast majority of research that's being done is from manufacturing companies in the country today. Exports, obviously there's a lot of attention that's being put on that right now, but exports of manufactured goods have an outsized impact in proportion to the number of people that are actually participating in the economy today. In this business, we talk a lot about a, a magic multiplier if you look at the number of people that are employed in direct labor in manufacturing, there's a multiple of many times that who owe their jobs to manufacturing. So stemming from that fundamental process, it's the people who are supporting the IT systems and the networks to make sure the data can get communicated. It's the support functions, it's the supply chain. And so the impact on the economy is in excess of just the raw number of people who are earning an hourly, wage, an hourly wage in manufacturing, although that's critically important as well.
countries around the world are recognizing the, the importance of manufacturing for the reasons I just mentioned to their overall economies. And so a variety of countries have launched initiatives to be able to stress the importance of advanced manufacturing because it's not just enough to manufacture. You have to be competitive against the very best in the world. And so these countries are launching initiatives that are designed to draw attention to the importance of manufacturing and also as a, as a target for additional assistance because they recognize that it's a strategic weapon, uh, quite frankly, to be competitive. We see China Manufacturing 2025. We see Industry 4.0. We see Make in India. All of them have some nuances. I, I think it's somewhat pointless to look at the relative differences between the initiatives from country to country. The important thing is that all of these have the common denominator that advanced manufacturing is important and a fundamental part of that is taking the data that's spun off as a natural byproduct of making whatever it is you're making and to turn that into useful information so that you can improve the outcome, so that you can make whatever you're making more efficiently. So it all has to do with the integration of the real-time control that's required to make the product and combining that with the insight from additional analysis of the information. And that's where the concepts like machine learning, artificial intelligence, all those things come in. Think of those as tools to increase the effectiveness of the fundamental process. The Rockwell view of this is, um, is something that we call the connected enterprise. And it, again, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, it starts with those basic products, those basic sensors. Um, I was touring some of the facilities here this morning and was hearing about you know, the th interesting things that you're doing with accelerometers and other types of sensors that might only be $5 or $10 to be able to get an amazing amount of information. And then when you couple that with the incredible computing power that all of us carry in our mobile devices, that ubiquitous access, that easy access to all this data is really unprecedented. And, uh, and it's mobile too, which is something that I, I certainly didn't see come in 30 years ago. But taking that data, being able to bring it to the place where it's most useful and to be able to perform operations on it um, to help tell you what's going on with your process and ideally to be able to make changes on the fly to optimize your process, that's where the state of the art is today. And that's, uh, that's what's going to really separate out, I think, the winners and the losers going forward is the be it, being able to take that data, to analyze it, and then real time to be able to bring it back into the process. And so that's what uh, we're focused on as are, as are our competitors. One of the other interesting things, um, nobody can do all this by themselves. Um, as you can see, this starts pressing up into the, the information layer, uh, so it's not purely a manufacturing problem. And I think, you know, a lot of us would be silly to try to do what some of the IT companies have many more resources already focused on. And so when you look at a cloud operating system, for instance, I don't think I'm going to win you know, that, uh, that arms race against Microsoft or Google or AWS. I'd like to be able to put applications on top of those basic operating systems to be able to add the value that we can differentiate as. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to see those, those information competitors coming down into this space because their calling card is simplicity. It's scale as well, but it's simplicity. And I'll, I'll mention that a couple of times. The simplicity of these things is really going to sort out who, who thrives and who doesn't. Um, because the decision makers here, they grew up in a plug and play world. You know, my, my daughter expects things just to work together and automation isn't like that today, right? Um, and uh, that's going to be important.
our customers care about having a connected enterprise because they need to increase their productivity. They're in a globally competitive environment. They're competing with the best manufacturers all over the world. They have to be able to innovate and we provide our technology and our expertise to help them make improvements in one or more of four fundamental business drivers. It's faster time to market for their products. It's lowering their total cost of ownership. It's increasing the utilization of their manufacturing assets. And it's lowering their enterprise risk. All of those things help a customer realize a connected enterprise. We have such a versatile family of products for so many different industries that very few of our competitors can match. We have the secure Ethernet communications, the very versatile control architecture, and we have such a great partner network that we're able to enable the information management solutions as well. Our products and our services are all relevant and all help that customer create their connected enterprise. It's an evolution. Our employees should really feel excited that we have the tools today to help our customers begin that journey, but we don't have to do it all at once. It's something that we can begin to implement across that wide range of industries. We have the building blocks that are relevant for oil and gas and for life sciences and consumer products and food and beverage. So that step-by-step -step approach ensures that as new technology comes out, as we develop expertise in new areas, that we're going to be able to help our customers grow for many years to come. You know, one of the things that um, I, I mentioned before that is at least as important as the technology and that's the understanding of what it is that you're actually trying to get done. Uh, the technology alone isn't going to save you. You have to understand how it's going to be applied. And so you know, some of the things that, uh, that uh, indicates is that there's going to be more engineering service to complement that technology. If you just uh, put a, a machine learning tool in place and accept, expect it to sift through the data um, without knowing first where to look, uh, you're going to waste a lot of time and you're, you're probably not going to have the result that you expect. So for the foreseeable future, it really is the combination of that. And then I mentioned before the simplification of all of this um, in terms of the technology, in terms of the business models to make it easy um, for somebody to be able to get in the game and to be able to, to uh, start to apply these concepts is really going to be crucial uh, going forward. Now, just as an example, in oil and gas, for instance, uh, some of the things that uh, are, are key needs, um, there's a lot of um, large uh, rotating assets in the oil and gas process, whether it's at the wellhead or it's at the, the terminal where you might be compressing natural gas, whether it's in the pipeline, uh, in the refining application, there's lots of pumps, there's lots of uh, you know, fans, um, there's, there's a lot of that equipment and there's a certain degree of safety uh, that, uh, that is an important consideration there. Also in terms of the, uh, uh, the gases that could be uh, released into the air. And so one of the advantages of being able to do more remote automation is to make the processes safer, safer for people as well. Also, oil and gas is one of the industries where you have truly huge data sets that you are operating on. And so whereas in a lot of the other manufacturing processes, you can do the analysis on the device itself or certainly at the edge in the plant, in oil and gas a lot of times bringing it back to an enterprise level and utilizing the cloud for some of that analysis is particularly interesting. Um, oil and gas companies also have enough money to where they can be the first and to go through that uh, uh, that learning cycle as well, and so a lot of times they are the forerunners in, uh, in some of these newer concepts as well. That scalability is really important. This isn't a, uh, this isn't a, um, a matter of taking all the data that you can find and sending it up to the cloud and then sorting through it. 
a key concept, and we hear this over and over from customers, is close that loop and perform the analysis at the point that it's needed, um, but don't try to send it all to one place because you're just not going to make the fullest use of it, and going back and sifting through that data level later has proven not to be a very, uh, a very efficient way of doing things. So for instance, if you're working with a variable speed drive where you have power semiconductors and the most common form of failure is that those semiconductors overheat and you, and you, you lose conductivity, to be able to sense the junction temperature of that IGBT and to be able to do something in the drive itself is really important because you're going you're gonna to smoke that drive if you wait to send that data up to the cloud and then to come back. There's just too much latency there and you don't need to. In a, in, a separate, uh, in a separate instance, if you're looking at the network communication in a plant and you're needing to do something to be able to bring back the traffic on that network before you start bringing lines down, the edge may be the right place to do that and to be able to analyze that data in a data center or something like that, but that might be on premise. At the end of the day, though, if you're looking at if you're looking at comparing the overall equipment effectiveness across multiple plants in a fleet of cookie factories that might be worldwide, might be 100 or 200, then being able to create dashboards, the best place to do that is probably in the cloud, where you're bringing up just enough information to be able to give management that insight as to who's running the most effectively and what are the bottlenecks on the laggards. And so it really is that scalability that's an important concept, something that all of us, all, all, of, all of the companies in this industry are chasing is the ability to have a common look and feel regardless of where you're actually performing the storage and the processing uh, functions. So to be able to have what you look at on your smartphone right up at the device and to have that similar to what a C-suite executive is looking at in the headquarters building across multiple plants, that's, that's what a lot of people are focusing on now. And again, it has a lot to do with the simplification of that because you're going to have different tech stacks at different levels. That's just the nature of it in terms of the amount of data and so on. But to be able to have a skin on the top of those tech stacks to be able to look similar, to be able to interact with it. Ultimately, you'll see more introduction of things like augmented reality, natural language processing. We're already seeing that uh, uh, mature enough to be used in plants. And over the next five years, I think you're going to see a rapid maturation of that. So, from 1987 to uh, 2018, um, um, as, I, as I look back at uh, the crystal ball and to see what, uh, what uh, came to be, what continued on a path, what kind of fizzled, and, uh, and what things uh, were, uh, were big surprises, this was a, uh, a partial list of that. We've certainly seen the continued replacement of jobs that are purely rote, repetitive labor with automation and we've seen most of the hardwired forms of logic processing replaced with more flexible forms of programmable control and in C. We've seen robots flourish, and this isn't just transportation, of course, anymore. Uh, we see increasingly robotics and advanced vision being used in packaging as well. And uh, I think we'll continue to see those trends. The costs will continue to go down. The connectivity between those different centers and the material feeds and the conveyance and so on will only increase. But I have to say, the state of, the, the, the state of ma manufacturers today is remarkably unadvanced. If you walk into a typical factory today, less than one in five of those plants are connected even amongst the machines in those plants. Uh, so walk into a steel mill sometime if you want to take a trip in a time machine and go back 50, uh, go back 50 years. The so things that are still you know, making steel were uh, the new processors and drives when I started out. And uh, it's just, it, again, there's that fear. You got something running, 
um, it's hard to go in and to make a change unless there's something truly transformational that, uh, that you can achieve from it. Mobility, I would say, is the one biggest thing that uh, caught, uh, caught us by surprise a little bit. We still haven't seen the full impact of mobility in manufacturing, but you know, traditional manufacturing plants have, have lots and lots of fixed stations for operator interface, for visualization, um, and um, I think we're going to see less and less of that because you can get the information you need when you need it and according to your job classification increasingly and we all carry pretty powerful devices with us so you know it's it's very questionable whether you need a lot of dedicated additional equipment to perform some of those functions and so that'll have a big impact on our industry over the next uh, over the next decade I mentioned before this industry's moved uh, moved slow. Now that's protected us, uh, you know, as we despair that we're not releasing products uh, as fast as we need to be. But that uh, that uh, uh, warm protective blanket is about to be pulled off uh, because, as you see, the IT influence uh, and their uh, uh, development cycles, as well as the uh, business models pushing down into the plant floor. Uh, we're going to see that move faster. And uh, uh, just as a, as a reference point, again, in, uh, in 1985, the market cap of, uh, you know, some of those reasonably large companies there, um, actually, Cisco wasn't public at that point, uh, and so their market cap was far below $5 billion, and today uh, it's quite, uh, quite a bit different. And that's, uh, that's due to the, the uh, relative risk aversion on the plant floor, all plant managers are haunted by the memories of projects that have gone bad, and that's why, that's why that simplification is so important. Productivity has obviously increased, and uh, you know, for those of us in the U.S., uh, the challenge is to be able to continue to find ways to climb that curve. And again, that's what that integration of control and information is designed to do, is to make companies more productive than they could be by purely automating the basic process. It's adding that analysis of the data to become even more insightful. There's, um, you know, there's a famous curve, I think Gartner came up with it, uh, which is one of the many consulting, in this, uh, consulting companies in this space. And they talk about, you know, the technologies that are on a curve, that's the, you know, the flash of insight um, when it's first uh, discovered and becomes widely known and everybody immediately looks at that as, you know, perhaps the, the, uh, the transformation of the industry. You go a little bit further on that curve and those technologies don't live up to their hype and you despair that you, you chase the wrong thing. Um, and uh, then eventually, you know, as you continue and climb out of the pit of despair, uh, you find that, uh, you know, there are things that uh, can truly uh, deliver, uh, deliver the kind of results that you originally hoped for. And, uh, you know, th this lists a few of those here. I would say in manufacturing, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, are still kind of in that early phase. The main monetization of those technologies today are companies buying and selling one another. It's not really getting uh, down to the uh, end user saving money quite yet in manufacturing. I think it will come, but that's, that's kind of where that is. In terms of a, a technology that's still uh, mired a little bit in the pit of despair, is uh, something that broadly is called asset performance management, uh, and that's uh, the idea of being able to do predictive maintenance, to be able to feed back into your uh, CMMS systems, your enterprise asset management systems, um, and to say, here's what broke in the past, and this is how I'll predict what, goes, what happens in the future. Biggest problem with those systems is they require manual input. It's not yet fully automated, and so it's only as good as your technicians and your operators feeding in that information into the system. And then finally, in terms of uh, technologies that are actually delivering some benefits, uh, when we look at some of the automated, even cloud-based error-proofing systems, whether you call it MES or 
maintenance and uh, you know operations management some of those systems are delivering uh, some fairly significant results but we'll continue to see technologies um, you know move through that curve with some um, even a large number of them falling off before they deliver their initial promise the the trick and the art in this business is to be able to uh, be engaged early enough in where the innovation is happening um, to see what ideas are coming out and then to pick more winners than losers uh, as, uh, as they mature. So you'll see, you'll see us and you'll see you know, all of the players in this space joining our IT counterparts in the innovation centers of the world, which is, you know, uh, includes Silicon Valley, um, as uh, they're talking about AI, recognizing that it's not going to make people rich yet uh, unless they sell their company, uh, but it's not going to make people rich uh, uh, in terms of the value on the plant floor for a while. We still have to be in that environment to be aware of what's happening. In terms of the technologies that can be automated, uh, I mentioned before natural language processing isn't fully mature on the manufacturing floor. Augmented reality has some use cases that uh, I think we'll see uh, start to be monetized over the next over the next five years. But a lot of these other examples, uh, they're there. Um, uh, they can be automated. It's just a, it's a commercial decision on whether uh, um, those are automated or, uh, or kept uh, in, the, in the domain of manual labor. It's like giving someone Superman capabilities. One topic I'm really personally excited about is the, is the concept of digital twin. We're redefining it here at Hannover Messe Industry. What we're able to do is actually show this really innovative machine from the Cama Group. That's a packaging machine. It's a physical machine, it's full operation, but we also are able to show it virtually. People talk about this as a digital twin. Really like a digital car in uh, real life. We use this in car engineering, uh, mainly in the early phase. With HoloLens, we can demonstrate that if you, by creating a digital twin, you can really uh, engage with your customers and create unique collaboration scenarios from the design phase into production, into building the process or into the product. Basically, this gives you X-ray vision. We can project our digital twin inside here and you're looking at the factory from a holographic uh, point of view. We issue a Microsoft chocolate. We're gonna command the robot, which is in a chocolate factory, to pick up a piece of chocolate and hand it to you. We are using this HoloLens uh, in our technical service. On this machine, we have a problem. We are connecting to the specialist that's sitting somewhere in the world. Uh, we worked with OSI Soft and Deschutes to do real-time data visualization of the, the brewing process. We're simulating a problem there, and we're being able, able to do remote assistance to Skype in and look at that problem, resolve it. Once our clients get in touch with us, um, they have a, an urgent need. We create digital twins, so we create a hologram, um, and this hologram we can show to our clients so they see the future stair lift um, in their real environment. We are cutting down lead times by four times. This is the largest industry show in the world. It's exciting to see that we have these companies here, both like partners as well as customers, taking the technology of Microsoft and turning it into real, uh, real business solutions. The Hanover Messe in Germany will take place uh, here in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, each year that's a, uh, probably the single biggest forum in the world for uh, new technologies to be showcased. Uh, so that's... Uh, a little bit of a snippet that uh, we put together with Microsoft at last year's fair. So what does this mean for us going forward? First of all, I mentioned it before, there's not enough people who have the interest um, or the aptitude in the workforce today um, to be able to feed the need for this advanced manufacturing. The, uh, the Bureau of Labor St Statistics talks about several hundred thousand unfilled jobs in manufacturing uh, where there's the need but the, the person to fill it can't be fi found. The number is expected to go up to several million over the next few years 
And this is real. Um, manufacturers across a wide variety of industries report that they can't find the people to be able to support their need to introduce advanced manufacturing. And some of that is a perception problem uh, that, uh, that people don't want to go into manufacturing like they once did. Some of it is an education problem where they're not getting the basic, uh, the basic uh, comfort with these types of technologies. Um, and um, so it's, in some, in some people's estimation, the single biggest challenge to a country being able to continue to be competitive in this area. And as you can expect, it's at all different levels. This isn't purely um, uh, in jobs that require a, uh, uh, a four-year degree or more. Um, we have a program, and I'll show you a short clip on it uh, in a minute, where we're training veterans uh, who typically have a high school um, education to be able to uh, develop the skills in a compressed period of time to take on technician uh, type roles. And uh, they have the basic skills. Um, they've proven that they can show up to work on time and pass a drug test and things like that, which, uh, which are important basic skills. Um, and uh, that's going to be an important part of the equation as well. So it's going to take people from a variety of educational levels uh, to be able to feed this need. But I think even more, maybe even more important than that is the recognition of the importance of this type of work. Somehow over a period of time, uh, there's been a perception that's changed that manufacturing isn't as important, and, uh, and it really is. And, uh, um, both in terms of a societal basis, but also in terms of an individual's importance to an enterprise, to be able to keep the basic process running that, uh, that produces uh, the value that a company is in business to create. I think another point uh, that uh, uh, increasingly we find, and I, I suspect a lot of you in this room would, uh, would agree with, is that you know, when you're looking for the companies that you want to work with, um, work with and work for, it's not just about uh, the specific job that, uh, that you have. It's also about uh, um, what is the greater good that you might be contributing to. And it, is this company an ethical company? Uh, is it uh, a company that you would recommend to your family and friends? Uh, is it a company that's doing something that you can draw a line of sight between what they do and uh, what you think is important to make the world a better place. And uh, so uh, we find that is, uh, is an important part of the equation as well. And I encourage you, those of you who are looking for jobs after, uh, after you get out of the academic world uh, uh, in industry, uh, that should be something that uh, is important to you. Because if it's not, then there won't be the kind of pressure that's needed on these companies to do the right thing. And so you have more power than you, uh, than you think in that respect. So here's that VETS training program, and this will be the last video, but uh, it's kind of a neat thing. The interesting part about this program, the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing, is it, it separates itself because it's, it's, number one, it's filling a void in the manufacturing world. We're filling a skills gap. But the other part of it is we're employing men and women who sacrificed for the country. My name is Christopher. I was in the Army and I was a 14 Tango, which is a Patriot Air Defense Artillery. My name is Jin. I was a Communication, Navigation, and Mission Systems Technician for the Air Force. I'm Chad. I was in the United States Marine Corps for seven years. Had some medical issues and ended up actually being medically retired. When I first got out, I was looking at the job boards and I actually saw, you know, a lot of jobs out there for automation and manufacturing, electrical, electronics type stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I've got the electronics experience, but I don't have, I don't know anything about PLCs or HMIs or any of this stuff at all.
It took a toll on me uh, emotionally because I went from this guy who's traveled the world. I felt like I was worth nothing to anybody because, you know, I started looking for jobs and really couldn't get any jobs or anything. And people were confused as to what I wanted from my resume. I had to start from scratch. I got contacted and did a phone interview. They were really excited, I was really excited. And I said, hey, you know what? This program seems like it was, it was made just for me. Not only for veterans, but it's in the industry, the manufacturing industry with the controls and automation, which is something I've always wanted to do, but I was never able to get into it. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm excited. I mean, as, as to which most people would be. I mean, I, I come from a background of doing a lot of hands-on things, troubleshooting, doing technical, you know, solving technical problems and such. So it's exciting to, to get to come in. As we embark on this program, the great thing about the partnership between Rockwell Automation and Manpower Group is we each bring elements that are critical to make these 15 people that are on pilot successful. And for them, success will be measured by proving out what they know via the Applied Learning Project, doing well on their engagements with their future employers, getting job offers, and having the opportunity of moving into a new role. So we, uh, we had that first class, we had uh, 14 uh, veterans. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge uh, uh, at the beginning of that class was convincing them that this was for real, uh, that we were actually gonna train them, that it wasn't gonna cost them anything, and uh, that this wasn't uh, you know, some, something bogus. And uh, all of them had job offers when, uh, when they got off the program. Uh, the second pilot uh, graduates, uh, uh, actually the second class graduates next week, two dozen out of Milwaukee, and uh, uh, we've already got uh, uh, pretty much a full class for the next one. So um, when uh, we first issued the challenge of uh, training 1,000 people a year, uh, there are a lot of people who said, yeah, divide you know, by a lot. Um, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and, it could, and it could happen. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, it, was, it was of many ideas that don't always work, this was one that seems to be working for now. So um, just a, a couple of closing thoughts. Um, so, you know, what's, go, what's gonna come, what's gonna come next uh, in, at, a, at a high level when we, when we think about the automation and the information world? Um, you know, the, there's, some big, uh, there's some big changes afoot that I don't think we fully understand. And if you call these things the sharing economy and recognizing that there's a lot of excess capacity in the system today, whether it's in computing or whether it's in transportation, how's that gonna impact those of us who owe our livings to making stuff? Um, and um, I don't think we fully know, but, but there's a few things uh, that I think are, uh, are here to stay and, and will only become more important. That, um, that um, easy, easy to obtain computing power that comes from um, your, your smart devices from cloud computing is really going to level the, tr the playing field and scale isn't going to mean as much. Um, in the past, one of the reasons that you had these conglomerates formed over the last hundred years or so was to be able to have a big enough you know, companies so that you could buy at lower prices and you could reduce your price, you could drive your competitors out of business, you could make enough profit to expand into new regions and new lines of work. Having that awesome computing power that you don't have to develop all within your own company levels that playing field and to be able to tap into that you know, we see it in software, but I think we'll also see it more and more in manufacturing as well as you, as you see increased flexibility in manufacturing processes today and at affordable prices, um, I think that's going to level the playing field, which is great, you know, for those of us who want to be able to innovate. The second thing is 
the changes in business models, and you know, you, you've heard this in, <laughs> until you're sick of it, but when you hear about an, an Uber, you know, that's a huge transportation company that doesn't you know, really have many vehicles, you know, it's just a different business model, and it's standing something on its head, and I think, again, you're gonna see that uh, the, uh, the uh, economy and in manufacturing, it's ripe for that. So why do you have to buy the controls if the thing that you're building you know is only going to be popular for a few years? Shouldn't you be able to lease that or being able to you know, have somebody manufacture it for you? I mean, these concepts aren't brand new, but I think you'll see more of that and the difference in business models um, uh, become more pervasive as time goes on. And then the final one, and I get asked this by analysts who are trying to decide whether to invest in our stock or not, is, you know, isn't all this excess capacity and these clever ways of kind of, you know, dealing with what's already been built going to result in people buying less stuff? You know, my, uh, my, my 16 year old, um, um, when I was his age, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license and to uh, run out and get, you know, my, uh, my dad's cast off uh, Chevrolet. He doesn't really care, you know, he doesn't really care about his license and uh, he's got friends to, uh, you know, to ride with and uh, so, uh, you know, having a car isn't the same thing that it once was. And I think uh, we will see as time goes on whether uh, people have the same desires to own more stuff, more durable goods and so on, or whether these business models as they take place, you know, in other parts of our economy reduce that need. And uh, so that's one that uh, I think we'll start to see play out again in the next five years or so. In summary, um, productivity has continued. Uh, it's not going to stop. And, uh, um, we are in a global economy, um, whether we want to be or not, and uh, we've got to be competitive against the very best uh, in, the, in the world. And that uh, goes for us, and that goes for our uh, you know, customers who make things who have to be able to compete around the world. That ITOT convergence is going to pick up the pace. We've been in kind of a sleepy industry. It's protected us you know, when we haven't been able to develop as quickly as we'd like to. Uh, but that's about to change as those IT influences, those big companies that have tens of thousands of software engineers um, are going to start uh, making their presence even more known in the, uh, in the plant floor. I mentioned before mobility was one that I certainly didn't see coming. Um, and uh, the only thing mobile that, you know, had a processor in it was the HP calculator that Georgia Tech made me buy. And uh, <laughs> so that's changed a bit over, over time. Um, the people with the right skills um, are in the short supply. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's some combinations. The things that you're doing here and the, you know, the maker labs that you have in this facility, you know, th those are the types of things that are in really, really short supply uh, in America and around the world, and uh, don't uh, don't lose that. Don't don't look at that as just some interesting thing that you did in school. Uh, think of that seriously as the underpinning of what could be a very uh, uh, very fulfilling career. And then uh, finally, you know the the theme of this. If you don't remember anything else, it's about that importance of simplification. The technologies are terribly complex. Uh, and that's not going to change under the hood, and you're going to have all different kinds of tech stacks to, to get done what you need to get done. But the ability to simplify the way that those pieces come together and how the user interacts with it is going to be terribly important over the next, uh, over the next 10 years. So with that, um, I don't know if we have time for uh, questions. Let, let's give Blake a round of applause.